Welcome along to another Enfield Physicist Does a Difficult Question, this time on mechanics. And it really is a difficult one. The diagram shows a uniform beam supported by two light cables AB and AC, which are attached to a single steel cable from a crane. The beam is stationary and in equilibrium. Part A. State the two necessary conditions for the beam to be in equilibrium. Well, if it's not moving up or down, that means there must be no net resultant force up or down, so the sum of the vertical forces must be equal to zero. And the fact that it's not turning in any direction at all means that the sum of the moments must also be equal to zero. Part B. What is meant by the centre of mass? Well, this is just a definition. The centre of mass is a point where the mass can be said to act. And it is also, therefore, the point from which the weight acts, the force downwards produced by gravity. Part C. Explain why the centre of mass of the beam in the diagram must be vertically below A. Well, this is because point A is acting as a pivot. If the centre of mass was off either to the left or the right of A, there would be an overall resultant turning force. And clearly there isn't, because it's in equilibrium. Therefore, the only way to have no moment from the bar is for the centre of mass to be directly below the pivot point. This question is now about to get harder. You have been warned. But breaking it down into its little components, you'll see it's not too difficult really after all. We're asked to consider or calculate what is T1 and T2, given that the weight of the beam is 12,000 newtons. And we'll start by taking out the left-hand triangle, which has T1 in it, as so. And see the angle there is 53 degrees. Now let's get the whole vertical component of T1. Let's call it T1y. That's going to be equal to T1 cosine of 53 degrees, because it's an adjacent angle. Similarly, T2 in the y direction is going to be equal to T2 cosine 37. Remembering that the sum of the upwards forces must be equal to the downwards forces, we can then write that T1y plus T2y is equal to 12,000 newtons. Now substituting in the components for T1y and T2y, we can now say that 12,000 is equal to T1 cosine 53 plus T2 cosine 37. Now we're going to consider the horizontal components of T1 and T2 and set them equal. So the horizontal component of T1 is T1 sine 53, and that has to be equal to the horizontal component of T2, which is T2 sine 37. Now we can use this formula to substitute back into the first one. We could say that T1 is equal to T2 sine 37 over sine 53. And of course you could make T2 the subject of this equation, it doesn't really matter. Now we're going to take the equation that's in the red box and substitute in for T1 with the new equation that we've just worked out. So we can say 12,000 is equal to T2 sine 37 divided by sine 53. And all that lot is equal to T1. Then we need to remember to times it by the existing cos 53. And now we can add that to T2 cosine 37. So now we just have only one unknown, and that unknown of course is T2. So now by carefully typing into your calculator the various sines and cosines that you have, we can get a simple value for T2. This means that we get 0.454 T2 for the first lot, plus 0.799 T2 for the second part of the expression. And all that, of course, is equal to 12,000. Therefore, we can say, if we add those two together, that 1.252 T2 equals 12,000. And so we have a value for T2. 9, 6, 0, 0, Newtons, 9,600 to two significant figures. 
Now we're in a position to work our way to get T1. Therefore, we can say T1 sine 53 equals T2 sine 37, which we derived earlier. Now we have a value of T2 to put in. I'm going to use this value. 9580, which is to four significant figures. This therefore means that T1 equals 9580 sine 37 over sine 53. And when you put that jolly lot into your calculator, you will get out 7,200 newtons to two significant figures, which of course is all you can justify. So as I said, that's fairly difficult, but there is another way to handle this part of the question. This second arguably easier way to do this question involves drawing a vector triangle. Here's our 12,000 newtons, which pretty obviously is going straight down. Next, we're gonna take T1 and draw tip to tail like so. And we can see fairly easily that this angle here between the two is going to be 53 degrees. Now we'll take our T2 and join its tail to the tip of T1 like so. We can now add the angle 37 degrees which is from T2 to the vertical, so that's this angle here. And now by similar triangles, we can say that the angle at the top between T2 and the 12,000 is also 37 degrees. We now have a triangle with two angles and one big force 12,000 newtons. We can therefore say that T1 is equal to 12,000 times the cosine of 53, again, because that's the adjacent angle. When you stick that into your calculator, you're gonna get out 7,200 newtons. Similarly, we can see that T2 is going to be 12,000 newtons times the cosine of 37. And again, sticking that into your calculator, you will get out 9,600 newtons. Just comparing the two pages there, it's clear that this one is simpler in many ways if you can visualize the triangle. But I wanted to show you both methods because, well, they're both good methods. Assuming that you don't really want to listen to me read out all this question, we're gonna start off by writing out our quadruple Decker fraction, which is the Young's modulus formula. And then we're gonna flip the delta L over L over, multiply that by F over A to get a much more attractive equation to work with. We now need to rearrange this to get an expression for delta L. This means that E delta L is equal to F L over A. And then bringing the E downstairs again, we can see that the extension is force times length over Young's modulus times cross-sectional area. Let's work out the cross-sectional area. Well, we know that's pi r squared, which of course is gonna be equal to pi times half of the diameter, 1.5 times 10 to the minus two, halved, and then all squared. And if you work that out, you will get One point seven six six times ten to the minus four meters squared. Now it's just a question of plugging in the rest of the values. So delta L equals the force, which is twelve thousand newtons, the weight of the bar, times the length, which is twelve, divided by Young's modulus, two times ten to the eleven, multiplied by now, it's at this point that I find myself in a bit of a conundrum. It really is much better not to work out parts of an equation like we've done with the area here and then plug it into another formula. Really, it makes much more sense to just write all the numbers in once. 
Bearing all that in mind, let's rewrite our expression for delta L, putting in the numbers, including the original numbers to work out the area. This way we will reduce any rounding issues. So the top line is the same, 12,000 newtons times 12 meters, divided by the Young's modulus, two times 10 to the 11, and rather than putting 1.766 times 10 to the minus four, let's put in pi times 1.5 times 10 to the minus two, divided by two, and then that radius value squared. And this will remove some of the rounding errors or make them less likely anyway. So now we end up with an answer of 4.1 times 10 to the minus three meters. There we are. There's the end of another exciting question. As always, nag, nag, nag. Please remember to subscribe to my channel. Please write down if you're finding this useful. And also, don't forget that if you want to leave me a comment suggesting a question for me to look at, well, why not give it a try? Bye.